Good evening and welcome to Nark Live on Wednesday the 18th of October 2023. I'm sorry I'm smiling, I don't know why. Why are you smiling? Nervous smile I think, nervous <laughs> laugh. Good, mo- good evening anyway, welcome to us to Nark Live with Tammy M0TC. Hello. And me, David G7RP. Good to see you. On tonight's show. We have six metre Earth, Moon, Earth and some stunning photography coming from David KJ9I. We look at a couple of amateur and radio and television events happening this weekend. And we find out what on earth this is or what it's for. If you have, we've had quite a few entries, but if you want to enter, as always, you can put that on PATC or Facebook and we'll include your entries when we get to that part of the show. But first, we start with uh, Club News and... It's Jamboree on the air weekend, for this this weekend. Uh, Jota, as often it's called. Um, Scouts for years and years, I don't know how old it is, but it's been going many, many, many years. And radio amateurs in many parts of the country, and indeed I think the world, get together and help Scouts and Cubs learn, and guides, learn about amateur radio and how to communicate so that maybe they can aim for their communicator badge and, and other things like that. Um, now, Bob G7JTZ and Paul G3VPT of Spixworth Scouts have told us that this coming weekend, which is October the 21st and 22nd, the Spixworth Scout Group will be taking part in Jota. The call sign will be GB2SPX at the Scout Hut on Crosswick Common. Anyone passing would like to give us a look, please do. The Common is off the North Walsham Road, the B1150, and the turning onto the Common is opposite the Old Rectory Hotel. Um, and the postcode is NR127BG. You can't miss the old rectory hotel, really. Um, and it's straight opposite there. There's a sort of hidden entrance, almost hidden anyway. Um, you just go down there. I'm sure they'd love to see you. It's 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday, and on Sunday between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. They would love to see you, I'm sure. And also on the Saturday, Reefham Scout Group are putting on a station to take part in Jota. Uh, that station is being operated by the Bitten DX Group. A call cool sign of that is GB1RSG, and the station will be Saturday only. So the Reefham one is only Saturday. The one at Spixworth is both Saturday and Sunday. I think I gave the uh, call cool sign of the one in Spixworth, but just in case, it's GB2SPX. So if you hear either of those on the air, work them, and even better, go and see them, maybe. Now, another thing that's happening this weekend, not not strictly speaking club and not even, I suppose, strictly speaking radio, but the British Amateur Television Club, which many of you watch this programme on and watching now, um, they have their live convention, part two, they call it Cat 23, um, and it's online, this one, with lots of talks, and we host it, Tammy and I host it from here. Um, It starts at 10 o'clock on Saturday and finishes at 3 o'clock. It's free for anyone to watch and you can head on to that link at the bottom there to watch it or if you just go to the same sort of places you are now basically, I think at the end we've Streamer. got... Streamer, it'll be in the live section. Yes, and I think yep. it, that's the same link though pretty much as we're on now except yep. there's, uh, we've got NARC at the end. Yeah, ours is NARC, yep, stream. NARC, so it's exactly the same as you're looking at now except it says CAT23 at the end. Um, and uh, you're very welcome to watch any or all of the talks. So we're starting at... 10 I think we run a, a program from just before 10 about quarter to 10 so we start streaming don't we yeah so I hope to see you there now um, as you know many months ago now Chris G4CCX sadly passed um, and as many of you know he had a, a great deal of equipment um, I remember several people telling me uh, in fact when um, I was to go to his ha- to house with the executor to sort of help her sort things out and switch things off um, how, how much equipment and that is not an exaggeration um, the equipment as you know could be sold in several ways and I, I, I just suggested to the executor there's sort of various ways it could be sold through a specialist retailer buying it all or putting it online on auctions but she's decided that it's going to a local auction which is really nice for people locally who would like to chance to buy some of his equipment so I'll be circulating this both to NARC members and to other local Norfolk clubs. But I can tell you that the first auction, I think we've got a, a caption here, a slide here. The first auction is on November the 1st, which is a Wednesday. 
at Swordston Village Hall. Viewing is from 8.45 in the morning and the auction starts at 10 a.m. We also expect to have auctions because there's so much stuff and it isn't just this, there be, might be furniture, there'll be audio equipment as well from him and maybe some equipment, uh, computer equipment. And there might be other things from other sales, obviously other people as well, but um, he's not gonna be all in one sale, um, but quite a lot of equipment, I can tell you, and that is no exaggeration. And there's also expecting, as you can see there, to have auctions on November the 29th and December the 13th at the same location. But I'll remind everybody of that as well on the newsletter. There's certainly gonna be auctions there, it's just how much of the equipment will go, find its way into each one. I went to the house last Thursday because there were five people who came forward and said actually they had equipment, oh, sorry Chris had got equipment from them either to borrow to have a look at or, or to, to repair um, and I've managed to find three of the five people's equipment and um, I've written to them today to let them know. Uh, we're still trying to find another couple of things so in case that's something that concerns you because I did put a, an originally a newsletter item out, um, it's just purely because there is so much stacked up floor to ceiling um, I couldn't get to everything and there was nowhere to put it to sort of just check all the boxes but I hope that all of the equipment will be reunited with their owners so I will put this in the newsletter though and finally as we mentioned last time we were here last Wednesday the complaint sched was scheduled uh, was uh, delayed postponed for a week because of the RSGB convention last weekend so it is this Saturday and I think we've got a slide to show you this Saturday at 10 a.m. on 7.123 megahertz. So quite a lot of things happening this weekend. Um, and as far as members news, we've had a bit of news, interesting news from Bob, G6PWS. Now, I'm sure most of us would have seen on the news the terrible fire that happened at Luton Airport in one of their car parks. And you would have seen a pictures like this. I think this is, is this a slide or a video, Tammy? This video. is a video that Bob took because he happened to go there the next day. He says that um, I deal with a company within the airport grounds and I was in their office at the time waiting to pick up one of my friends from a flight in. I was collecting four laptops that needed setting up, which is why, which is what I do, um, the IT for the company. So this pic, these sort of pictures, you probably saw the state of it, but, um, Bob also saw, and in a moment this ends, I think, this video, you probably saw those sort of pictures on the news. But in a minute, we've got some exclusive footage which Bob shot. This was from the actual room, the CCTV footage from the actual floor. So this might be exclusive. I don't know that this was used on any media. This is what happened when the car exploded. I think you could just see the ceiling falling. Yeah, so presumably well. it was in the car above. Mm. It's quite stunning, isn't it? So Bob, thank you very much for sharing that with us. I'm quite staggering. I don't think they know yet what it was, whether it was a, a, a conventional fuel car or a battery car, battery car, whatever, but anyway. So thanks very much for that. Um, Tammy, over to you, little people. Little people, yep. Yeah. Hang on, we queue up, yeah. Have you ever wondered what little people do when they want to exercise? They go on a treadmill. But I know that as something else. Do you remember <laughs> what they are, Tammy? Please say yes. Please say I know what that is. They're uh, things that go in frames on a wall, aren't they? Oh. <laughs> you must have read them about them in history books and stuff. <laughs> no, that is lovely, isn't it? That That's is a really 33. Good. See? A, oh, you I know. know you know. Ah, but it could be a 45 single. No, because you know it's that? too big for that. No. I know, a not 45 a 45 single. single. A long playing single, sorry. A long playing signal. Sing, sing, single. Yeah. Do you want me to show you my disco collection? No. <laughs> There's a chat up line if ever open. <laughs> anyway, they do a new picture like this every day, and you're welcome to have a look at it. Miniature calendar.com. And Tammy picks one out for us every week. I'll, I'll try and find one for you. Thanks. You know, dare I mention, you know, whose wedding? You know, we did that thing on the floor. Some people did. Oops, upside your head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, some of you will be old enough to know what that is. Um, I, as a DJ, when I was about... Disco Dave? Yeah, 18 or 19 or something. We had that as a, a, what was called a 12-inch single. And that was a very, very long record for people to get on the floor and go, oops, upside your head. I said, you know, anyway. 
she didn't want to know that. See, we don't just talk radio on here. <laughs> anyway, what have you been doing? Do keep in touch, just like Bob sent us those pictures. Keep in touch with us and let us know. Just send us details to radio at dcpmicro.com. If you get it to us by the Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock at the latest of uh, an arc live, then we will uh, we'll read it out. What was that? A 12 inch single. single? Yes, yeah. exactly. 12 inch signal, single. David Stansfield put on there. Right. Oh, J Jota, by the way, so I should really try and read some of these. It's difficult when we're, we're keeping on track. But uh, Mike G8EY says that Jota started in 1957, which is pretty impressive. Hmm. That's older than me. <laughs> Thankfully, something had to be. Right. They remember records from those days as well. Anyway, shall we have a look at the mystery item? Yep. We asked you last week with a competition. We said, what on earth is this? And we da, found da, this da, ourselves, da. didn't we? We did. That, was that a clue? Anyway, let's read out the entries. I see our guest smiling in, in the States now. He's he waiting for is. us. And I wonder if he knows what it is. Anyway, <laughs> let's, let's start. Um, Steve G3VA says, this week's object is a Venetian blind cleaner. Mm. Daniel M7GDR, it's a duster for Venetian blinds. Mike GAEY says, this one looks like a Venetian blind cleaning brush. Bruce G4KZT, I reckon it's a Venetian blind duster. Ken M0KJW says, this one I'm fairly sure is a gadget for cleaning Venetian blinds. Ralph 2M0RHT, this week's object is a duster for central heating radiators or a tickling stick for Tammy's little people. I yeah. like that. <laughs> it could be that. It could be that. Um, uh, Colin, uh, sorry, no, John 2E0TWQ says, I believe this is a vertical or Venetian blind cleaner. Colin M0GMK, uh, this week's object is a Venetian blind slack cleaner. Tony M0TDK, I think this week's mystery object is a d device for dusting or cleaning Venetian blinds. Um, Neil G4HUN, it's a dust of Venetian blinds. Bob GSTU says this looks like a Venetian blind cleaning tool to me. Uh, Mark G0LGJ, I think the item is a Venetian blind cleaner. And Martin G7UGB says I think the mystery item is a head polisher. Used extensively by yours truly. Oh, well. Should we see what it is then? And the answer is... The answer is... It's no! A head, it's a no, head cleaner. No, no, oh, is no. That the I just photo? Really, no, you don't show that one. Oh, okay. Move on. All right. It is actually a blind cleaner. <laughs> Thankfully. You didn't want me to set a picture of me with that. <laughs> I was just trying out what Martin said. <laughs> anyway, well done to most of you got it right. It's a useful gadget. If you've got Venetian blinds, you'll know it's an invaluable gadget, really. It takes ages without something like that. Hmm. Thank you very much. And I did appeal for pictures of more items last week, and we did get a couple sent to us, so thanks oh, for sorry, those. Paul as well. On, oh, sorry. Um, Paul McGee says it's a blind wipe. Blind wipe, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, so we did, um, last week, we, we did talk, ask you for sending in any more mystery objects. We've got a couple, but we're still looking for more to keep us going with Narc Lives throughout the winter. So if you have a mystery object or an unusual object or tool or gadget or whatever in your home, please send it to us, the usual address, and we'll include it on a future show. What have we got for you this week? Well, this is one of those ones that people did send us, someone did send us last week. Do you know what on earth is this? Clean answers only, please. That's I'm wondering if, if we should just give a slight clue in, no. in saying how big it is. You always... No. Okay. No, you always tell me off for giving clues. I think there's a clue on there how big it is anyway, actually. Oh, look. okay. Don't you agree? Yep, all right. Come on, Tammy, you never let me give a help. help you clue. always give clues. <laughs> right, so you've got two weeks because we're not meeting here next week. Uh, we're meeting online again in two weeks' time. So you've got just under two weeks to let us know what on earth you think that is, send it to radio at dcpmicro.com before three o'clock on that Wednesday. And um, we will reveal all then. Okay. So that's almost it. We're ready to meet our guest pretty much in the States. Uh, but first, just to let you know what's happening this week at NARC. On Saturday, we've got the Koblenz Sked on 7.123 megahertz at 10 o'clock. Um, and on Sunday, the GB2RS News at 7 o'clock in the evening on uh, G4 
GB2, or GB3MB, sorry. On Monday at half past seven, the Monday night net on GB3MB repeater, and at eight o'clock, the 80 meter CW net on 3.543 megahertz. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, on Wednesday, October the 25th, we've got a meeting at Sixth Form Common Room of CNS between seven and half past nine. And it's uh, an informal with Raspberry Pi sessions as well. Both Jeff and James will be there. So if you're interested in putting your Raspberry Pi circuit to, to good use, either on the software side or on the hardware projects, then Jeff or James are your people and they'll be here next week as well. And the other thing is please keep in touch with all your news and everything. And don't forget that we have this card, which we're very happy to send to anybody who you feel will be cheered. With this, just send us your their name and address, and we'll add your name to ours and send them to them. Send anything for the show to radio at dcpmicro.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Now, I'll be looking forward to meeting tonight's guest because, as you know from the beginning of the program and indeed all the publicity up to this, Earth Moon Earth is something that most amateurs know about, but very few amateurs get to actually try or know much about and tonight we've got an expert from the states who's going to come and tell us all about it and how to work it as well on 50 megs or six meters so it's a real welcome to dave kj9i hello dave hello thank you david hello everybody good to thank see you. you thank you very much for doing this now we can see that you're in an office it's not a sort of typical home office and you're actually at school or college at the moment aren't you right right i've got students next door actually measuring active high pass and low pass filters right now so um yeah that's what's going on next door oh great and, uh, so are they, are you presume you're a teacher of electronics and then are you yes yes and i do have a ham club here too i started kilo delta nine bravo oscar golf just to try to get some of the folks interested i think we've got nine licensees so far i actually give them i don't give extra credit for much of anything but if they earn their ham license they do get a half grade of extra credit in my class so oh, yes i great. do check from our hobby is that bribery or no it's, it's just incentive isn't it <laughs> <laughs> i look at it as an incentive yes yes okay excellent yeah by the way i know you mentioned earlier when you were doing a rehearsal with us uh a, a friend of yours who you've met through doing this um roy g3zig and he's put a message on here saying please pass on my 73 to david so he's 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 uh, he's watching this right now Anyway, Wonder. we're going to hand it over to you now. We, we did have a slight technical problem, probably because of restrictions using IT in your school earlier on um, for playing out slides and sharing slides. So you've kindly sent them to us and we're going to play them out under your cue. So um, fire away. And, we'll, and as always, by the way, everybody at home, if you've got any questions or comments to ask Dave, uh, we hope he'll be able to stay at the end for a little while um, in time um, to, to answer some questions before he has to go back to, to see his class. So over to you, Dave. Thank you so much, David, and welcome, everybody. Uh, six meter Earth, Moon, Earth, uh, you can advance. Uh, we're going to advance the slide. We'll move through this um, talking about some two meter experience. And that's where I first met G3ZIG about 20 years ago. He and I worked on two meter CW. Um, and so we'll talk through the details of the array and then some photos later about the construction project, which was a bit unusual. Advance, or next slide, thank you. There's the array for G3ZIG. This is the antenna that was used when I contacted him. Um, and for size perspective, uh, that's me standing on the left side of the tower, uh, partially up the uh, two high by four wide um, eight Yagi array that I used between about 2000 and 2005 on two meters. So that was back in the CW days and it was where I got my first EME experience. Next, please. Okay, and uh, that system was eight antennas, uh, basically uh, an SSB electronic uh, LNA. And at the time I was using a JRC HF transceiver with a transverter uh, behind it and a lunar link power amplifier Okay, next, please. All right, then I put up a my first six meter moon bounce array, which was four 6M9 KHWs. This was again in the almost all CW days, 
WSJT was just starting to happen at this time frame, and JT44 was just a brand new thing. But this was my very first six meter array from which I learned many, many things. This was all M squared. The antennas, the H frame, the rotators, pretty much everything was M squared. Um, next, please. And the different antennas that I've used, um, I've tried a number of them. My very first on the left-hand side of this diagram was an M squared 6M 2.5 WLC. That's about a 50-foot boom. Uh, then I used four 6M9 KHWs in that moon bounce array you saw a slide or two ago. And then after that, I changed to C3I. I had a 13-element Yagi that I tried, and then I used that for a number of years. After that, I went to Innov antennas, um, and um, I used their LFA loop-fed um, uh, antennas, uh, and that's what I use currently. So I've had a number of those, and uh, that's the, 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 the different antennas that I've used. Next slide, please. Um, upper left... In the, in the early 2000s, EME was all CW. We used to coordinate things. This is two meters using a newsletter. DF2ZC would kindly, I think he still does, do a newsletter for two meters. Uh, D expeditions were operated from fixed SCEDs where you would get a time slot that VE7BQH Lionel would assign, and, and that was your chance to work the D expedition. If you succeeded, great. If you didn't, it was on to the next person. Um, echo testing was done back in the day. You could listen for your echoes. Uh, now today, going over to the right half of the slide, near, nearly everything, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, I'm just saying that's what we have now. Um, much of the EME activity, at least two meters and six meters, is digital modes, WSJT. Uh, websites are used to coordinate uh, operating activity. And uh, we've got an echo test utility that's kind of handy for checking echoes. Um, next slide. Okay. When I was originally going to build a six meter array, lower left shows my plan. I was going to do eight Yagis, smaller Yagis, two high by four wide. The problem is to do this requires a 90 foot wide cross boom. So your age frame has to be 90 feet wide. And I just decided that that was too much to ha manage. So I reluctantly reverted back to the classic four times nine design. Uh, next slide. When I revised this plan, here are the specifics. Uh, the antennas that I chose are four LFA 10s. Um, I like everything about those antennas, except I'm a fan of round booms, mainly for wind loading. Um, and so I homebrewed my own round booms and basically built LFA Yagis on those booms. Uh, the support tower is one that I reused and beefed up from my two meter days. Rotators, I tasked the uh, late K7 November Victor with... Um, um, overhauling an extra large prop pitch. And then I asked if he could create an elevation rotator using a small prop pitch. And he did both of these for me. Um, and that's what became the rotors that I have now. Uh, LNAs, and then uh, I do still use transmit receive sequencing. Okay, next slide. All right, software is a huge part of EME these days. Um, 20 years ago, um, everything was CW, and the only software that I used then would be two things. One, a program to track the moon, and, and two, a, I used uh, LINRAD at the time to do audio processing on the CW signal. Those were the only software applications that I used, and MoonSCED by the late GM4JJJ, which is my favorite still for planning schedules and, and, and planning on moon activities. But look today at all the software that's involved. That's the point of this slide. The, the, the EME has become heavily software intensive compared to 20 years ago uh, when it was not. Next slide. All right, the top level system diagram looks basically like this. 
Over in the upper right, the four arrays with the two rotor controllers. Um, and then those are computer controlled. Uh, and I currently use PST rotator, which is working terrific. And then I, uh, the green heron controllers for the prop pitch motors. Over on the left side is the radio chain. Currently, I have a K3S at the lower left. Then I've got an SSB uh, LT6S transverter, mainly for the receive capability. And then that drives a uh, Elecraft KPA500. That's The job of that is mainly to bring the RF level of the transverter from five or six watts up to about 70 or 80 watts. And then the final amplifier at the top is a Henry, and that does the one and a half KW of output at full duty cycle. Uh, next slide. Okay, the predicted pattern for the antennas, complements of Justin, G0KSC, is here. Um, so the uh, next slide, please. And this is for LFA10s. Um, VE7BQH creates these tables that predict really well the antenna performance. The GT for this system is, is minus 17.7 dB. The gain, 18.87 dB of the four the four tens as is configured. I use the full VE7BQH recommended spacing. So the values from Lionel's spreadsheet are what I used for spacing. Um, and so basically you've got, what is it, 9.47 meters of, of uh, width. And I'm trying to read, it's hard, it's hard to even see the numbers, but they're basically, it's the full VE7BQH spacing, vertical and horizontal between the antennas. Okay, next slide. Low noise amplifiers, um, I know that there are debates over should we or should we not use an LNA. I do use an LNA. The current one I use is made by SSB, and it's out at the tower. Uh, that, it, uh, that also gets debated, but I wanted to scratch for every 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 dB I could get. Um, I also have had excellent luck with the Hotel Alpha 8 Echo Tango uh, preamps uh, when those were available. All right, next slide. Okay, the, um, the the wiring that is in place for the for the system looks like this. Uh, this basically shows the transmit receive wiring primarily. I use two relays, um, both from, from SSB Electronic. That upper left one is a EME um, HF four thousand two, and it's a seven sixteenths DIN connector relay. Then I have another one over to the right that's more gold colored. Those two relays are to provide enough isolation between the transmit and receive signal so that I don't destroy LNAs. Um, and then of course the sequencing hardware and timing and, and, and power and all those details are shown here. Uh, next slide. Here's how it looks as built. This is my preamp box, which is at the top of my moon bounce tower. And that's not as scary as it sounds. It's about 33 feet above the ground. So even I, as scared as I am of heights, can climb up there and work on this when I have to. Uh, upper left is the big transmit receive relay. Uh, on the right side, you can see the LNA and then the other relay and then a terminal strip to uh, try to organize the uh, control signals. Okay, next slide. Uh, timing, I do use a transmit receive sequencer so that when switching from transmit to re from receive to transmit that you allow plenty of time for that um, receiver to get switched to ground and so that you're not transmitting hot into your LNA. And this is the four four step sequencer that I use. It's a very old one, 20 years old. I used the same thing on my two meter system. This was made by uh, Down East Microwave many years ago. They still have the circuit boards available. They just don't make the little box to put them in anymore. Uh, but that's the TR sequencer that I use. Next slide. Uh, here's control cable documentation. Um, I document everything just for troubleshooting ease. Uh, next slide. And then at the top of the tower, I put little test points. And these are boxes that have little terminal strips inside of them, mainly as test points for troubleshooting. Next slide. OK, here's the uh, system. It's the Elecraft K3 with the transverter right above it. And 
Um, the, the final amplifier is in the basement, so that's nice because it's noisy and it's warm. So all of that is in a different room. Uh, and then when I was originally doing earlier six meter work, I used to use five receive computers um, and I would have some of them running Windows, some of them running Mac OS X, and then some of them running Linux. And I would run WSJT on each of these. And I found that even though theory says they should all receive the same, experience tells us that that's not the case. And even Joe Taylor insists that they should all receive the same. Yes, in theory, that's correct. In reality, there are differences. There are times that one computer will get a decode that another will not get. And um, so that's, I don't use five computers for receive anymore. It's a little bit hard to keep up with all that when I'm operating, but I do use two. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the old receive system with uh, the five receive computers. This was especially helpful on JT65 modes because quite frankly, JT65 was not quite as sensitive as the new Q65 mode is. All right. And there are dual receive chains you can see detailed here also. At the top center, you'll see the conventional receive chain with the SSB transverter feeding the Elecraft radio. And then the lower section shows the SDR. I've got an AirSpy R2 SDR dongle that feeds into SDR console by Simon Brown. That software is terrific, and um, I use that as my other receive chain. So I constantly do a bake-off, if you will, a competition between the two receivers to see which one receives versus the other. Next slide, please. All right, and so this is what the current system looks like with uh, the two. Uh, the upper part, again, is the conventional um, SSB transverter into Elecraft radio that goes into my Mac mini, which is my transmit computer running WSJTX improved. And then below that, I've got the AirSpy receiver and that runs into the Windows computer, which uses SDR console. Okay, next slide. Uh, this was back in the day how we used to track the moon. This was by W9IP. Uh, Nova for Windows, and if I could still get this to install, I would still use this because it was a great program, but it is, I believe this was written for Windows XP. Does anybody remember Windows XP? This is the era that that, that was used. Next slide. And this is the old Linrad, Linux Radio, um, SM5 BSZ, I believe it is, brilliant EME guy, um, and I believe he's the author of this Linrad software which has been an incredible help to EME people uh, for, for receiving. And this is the configuration for in the CW days. Next slide. Okay, then things move along. We use WSJT, and this is more of a more recent look involving the uh, WSJT software. Over on the left, you'll see the windows for PST Rotator. That's the rotor controller software. Then over on the right is um, an earlier version of WSJT with with MAP65, which was an attempt to decode everything across the entire band in one sweep. Next slide. Okay, this was the uh, Linux. I, I ran Linux, and this is GM4JJJ's Moonsked for Windows running on Linux Fedora Core, which is, of course, the later version of what used to be Red Hat Linux. And um, it just was a wonderful wonderful software. I am still a major fan of, of the Moonsked uh, software. It just works so well, and the user interface is so nice for, uh, for Moonbounce. Uh, next slide. And this, of course, is because GM4JJJ was, like us, a Moonbounce guy. Here's another window that shows over the course of a month how the moon conditions vary. Okay, next slide. And then here's an example of the current WSJTX software with uh, some decodes and stations showing. Uh, now, I do, I do not want to ask all of you to read the text on these images. It's very difficult to do this, but you can perhaps see uh, typically the, the yellow backshaded messages are those that are being transmitted. The green backshaded messages are typically I believe those are CQ messages, and the red messages are the ones that were specifically having my call sign with them. So this was an example of, of working, um, uh, I think it was YL2GD, I believe. 
Okay, next slide. And this is using Q65-60A. All right, back to software. Here is Simon Brown's wonderful SDR console. Uh, those of you that uh, run an SDR and have not yet tried his software, you must. You must try it. It is, I believe, the absolute best. Uh, you can tailor this. And for six meters, I have different sections. Um, in flex radio, people have slices or sections of the band, different receivers. With this software, you can subdivide the spectral space into really nice windows so that you can show the terrestrial Q65 in one window and, and frequency region. And you can show the FT8 up at 50.313 megahertz in another window. And you can show another window of FT8 50.323. And then you can show another window of moon bounce at 50.190. You can show all of these simultaneously. And as you can see on this window, there's um, kind of in the center, you can see those nice brightly colored areas. That's sideband and CW activity. So you can see what's going on across the entire band at a glance. And that's just wonderful. It's color coded. I just cannot say enough great things. And also the noise blanker on SDR console is tremendous. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, in terms of setting everything up, now what do we do with all of that? There are several people who are very dedicated to traveling, putting DX places on the air. W7GJ has traveled to about 20 countries. Drago, S59A, has traveled to a number of places. Bernie and Paul from South Africa have traveled putting places on the air. And I know that this list is not all inclusive. Um, I know there's a gentleman from Norway. I think it's LA7GIA. Some of the some of our friends from Norway have traveled to various JW, JX places. There are a number of people that have traveled. Um, OZ1DJJ has gone to OX a number of times. And uh, there are just a lot of people that are putting six meters on the air. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are just some examples of what does a Q65 contact look like. Uh, I keep screenshots. This is my Mac after I worked Lance in Mayotte. This was oh, a year or two ago. Um, and I thought the local uh, lemurs were kind of interesting. And I chose a, a color profile on my waterfall to kind of match that. So this is my TO7GJ contact. Also, if you look in the center of the screen, you can see that horizontal blue strip. And in that strip, you can see that, that vertical red uh, spike. That sync finder is what it's called, synchronization finder, is part of the Q65 mode that searches out and looks for across the spectrum, is there any signal in this noise that looks like a synchronization signal? So it helps you find a very weak sync signal because as you can imagine, they're not always visible, even when you can decode some of these signals. Next slide. Here's an example more recent of 3 Bravo 9 uh, GJ when Lance went to Rodriguez. And I know many of you in Europe, probably this was not very exciting maybe because uh, you have trans-equatorial propagation, but uh, most of us in North America, most, never heard 3 Bravo 9 before Lance's trip. Uh, or we would get a very small opening and not able to work them. So Lance went there. This was the contact with him when he was in Rodriguez. Okay, next slide. All right, here is Austral Islands. Uh, this is, again, uh, another uh, one of Lance's trips. Uh, next slide. And here's when he was at the Marquesas Islands. Now, if you look at the black section here that has the waterfall, you'll see every other minute under the, hmm, if I could point here to the center of the screen, if you look at the marks, how can I describe this? Look at the bottom horizontal blue strip, find the blue, I'm sorry, find the red vertical spike. Straight above this is where Lance's signal is. So if you look above that, that is... Tango X-Ray 7, Mike Bravo on Marquesas. Now, all of the others that are not vertically aligned with that, those are other callers that are calling Lance 
trying to work him during that expedition. So you can see on the waterfall the classic pattern that you get with Q65, which is a kind of a vertical left synchronization uh, stream. And then you see what I call paint splashes over on the right side. Those are your data bits, which comprise your tones, your message that you're sending, which would be saying something like TX7MB, this is KJ9I, sending you a minus 27 signal report or whatever it is at the time. Okay, next slide. Um, this goes back farther to JT65A. Uh, this was a very lucky QSO I had with 4S7AB using JT65, and it, um, I was kind of surprised that this decoded because you can see by the signal level it decoded at minus 32 the first time. At this time, I had five receive computers looking for this signal. Uh, this was the Linux computer that got the decode here that none of the others got, so at least not as early. Okay, next uh, next slide. All right, here's A21 EME when the South African gentleman went to Botswana. Uh, this was Linux Debian receive computer. Next slide. Okay, and then Lance, now we're going back farther in time. This was JT65. Uh, I'm trying to look at the date on the uh, on the on the main screen here. What is that? 2018, 19, something like that. This is when Lance was in Seychelles, and this was JT65. You can see the decoded messages on the waterfall display here. I like to keep screenshots of all my QSOs. That way, if ever it comes up, did you really work this guy? I can prove it. And, and it's more for me. I, I like looking at these. They're fun to look back and say, how strong or weak was that particular station at a given time? You can also determine things like how accurate was their transmitter frequency compared with mine by looking at previous screenshots. So I'm a big believer in, I'm kind of anal about keeping documentation. I keep screenshots on all of these just to uh, look back at. Okay, next slide. And here's Tango 77 Charlie. This is the group that went over to uh, T7. Uh, I think they used two eights, two eight element Yagis side by side. Uh, Drago and the gentleman, a uh, number of the guys from Italy, teamed up and put uh, Tango 77 on the map. Okay, next slide. Here's VK9XGJ from uh, earlier trip. Uh, next slide. And then here's one that goes way back. Uh, this was this was 2003, and uh, almost all of my hundred countries, I think a hundred of the hundred three that I have were CW. But I do have some that were uh, JT44, which was brand new at the time. This is one of the ones that I worked using the brand new at the time JT44. For those that are not happy with how Q65 works, have a look back 20 years. This is how we used to do it. JT44 required you to look through a stream of letters, and you had to look for the letters you're looking for. It wasn't nicely uh, created so it would lay out your decode in front of you. You had to go fishing for the text stream within the, the total. So what I did is I took my green highlighter, and I highlighted the streams of of letters that were significant here. You kind of get the idea. It was not as user friendly as what we have today. The software has evolved in a big way. Next slide. ZL1RS is a very good friend. Um, Bob is a uh, he is definitely expert EME guy. He's traveled all over the world put on expeditions on two meters and six. Well, last year in the ARRL EME contest, Bob did this little experiment. He did not tell me he was going to do this, but he took a three element Yagi and he put it on a stick in his yard and he aimed it at the moon. And he did kind of a, how low can you go move? Cause he knew I was on for the whole contest. And so after I decoded him and worked him with three elements, he tried, uh, he tried, Okay, that, that wasn't low enough. Let's try again. Next slide. So this time he took a dipole. Yes, a dipole, and put it on a stick. Here's the photo, and he aimed it at the moon. <laughs> and he called me. And uh, this was with another call sign, because he's got a club call sign, and then he's got his ZL1RS. And so 
I did not know what he was up to, but later I found out he was um, calling me with just a dipole and we made a contact and I'm still amazed that that worked. Uh, now, we credit a couple things. One is obviously ZL1RS's expertise. He was he leveraged ground gain on both ends of the path because it was moon rise in ZL while it was moon set in North America. That's a big part of the extra gain that we added into this equation. Also, um, Bob is just a very good EME guy. He understands get that signal to noise ratio the best you can. So he ran one kilowatt into this dipole and worked me um, uh, last year. And uh, so, yeah, that was one of those QSOs you just never forget. I still can't believe we did that with a dipole uh, and, and the array, but it, it is possible. So next slide. <clears throat> okay, what did I learn from the first arrays? Uh, maximum signal, minimize the noise. Uh, high quality components reduces your long-term cost. Uh, mechanical balance is not optional, it's essential. Otherwise, you're just spending all your time fighting rotator problems. Uh, good feed line, good low loss feed line. I love Andrew Heliax. Um, it's great stuff as long as you keep water out of it and as long as it does not get hit by lightning. And then EME contests to work uh, to, to increase the activity level. Next, please. Okay. Uh, if anybody wants to read more, I find this absolutely fascinating. Joe Taylor wrote this article talking about all the physics of EME. Here's the here's where that lives. Um, and, and Joe, as you know, is a physics professor at Princeton, so he's a very bright man. Uh, but he wrote this article that is fascinating if you really want to delve into why EME does what it does. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, any questions up to this point? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dave, so far. Um, we haven't got really questions. We have got a comment, which won't mean much probably to you, although it may do if you've been doing it long enough. Um, but um, one of um, uh, people watching, Richard Neal, has said he remembers Pat Gowan, G3IOR, doing moon bounce nearly 50 years ago on wow. two meters. Now, I don't know how old you are, but you don't look maybe like you'll remember that. Um, but Pat was very, very well-known amateur from this area. He did lots of training, got a lot of people interested and and through their license here. And I know lots of people watching this will know Pat. So thank you for that, Richard. He adds, by the way, that was on two meters that he did that. 50 years, so it's not new, but obviously what you're showing now is, you know, is some of the news take on it, especially when you add computers, I guess. So no other questions or comments as such, but as always uh, to everybody at home, you can ask questions on BATC or Facebook or make comments or anything that you've tried. Uh, share that with us so that when Dave has finished his talk, um, you know, we can we can read those to him. Anyway, back to you, Dave. Thank you so much. And yes, it's 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 delightful to hear 50 years ago EME was was happening. I would have been nine and a half years old. So I do not remember that and uh, had not yet discovered ham radio just mm. a few more years later. But that is terrific. And, and, and my hat's off. It was a lot harder uh, back in those CW days. Um, and the one thing I didn't mention, when I first had my four nines six meter array, it used to take 12 to 15 attempts to make one QSO in those days. It was all CW. It was just much, much more difficult. Now the software brings more than 10 dB of leverage uh, to us. So it really helps um, make the game a lot nicer. And it has enabled people with single Yagis to work work uh, us so yes thank you yeah, it'll be interesting to talk to you at the end about um aerials and antennas and things but, and see how much maybe they've progressed as well anyway that's just a thought of something we can talk about later but back to you for your uh, back to you and the slides dave thank you thank you and i'm gonna i'm gonna make a pretty fast trip through this construction because there are quite a lot of pictures and i don't want to have you all be sleeping um if there's something that you're really interested in we can go back to that but I think I think we can go through it pretty quickly one of the things that I know everybody who's done moon bounce knows very little of this of the required hardware is available off the shelf of many of the things you have to make are custom uh, custom design okay next slide 
And that's just the nature of it. This was my old two meter tower. I started by built by re updating the top section. Next slide. Okay, and I took that and I and I then added the next section down, made sure everything still fit back together after a couple of QTH moves. And by the way, you can see there's snow on the ground. As you all know, snow is a requirement to make the thing work well when, when you're done. Next slide. So when I built this, um, the parts that I had for my two meter tower were not quite tall enough for what I needed with my new six meter design. Therefore, I had to home brew or fabricate that bottom new section. So I had legs for the tower. You could see those on this right here on the right hand end of this uh, slide. Next slide. But I needed to make all the cross pieces. So what I did is I, I applied the same taper and I did my best imitation of a mechanical engineer and I figured out the cross braces. They were obviously stronger because you're closer to the ground, thicker steel. And then um, I basically built those, had them drilled, and then um, had them hot dip galvanized so that they were rust protected. Next slide. All right, and then I pre-assembled. This is before the bottom cross pieces were galvanized. You can see they're still raw steel. Next slide. Okay, and then after they were galvanized, I put the whole thing together and um, took this to my machine shop guy uh, a few miles up the road because his job now was to fabricate a base for this that goes in the concrete where the holes would line up the first time. And he said to me, and he's really good, he said, bring me the tower and I can make a base that will match. I said, okay. So he loaned me this trailer and I used my brother's pickup truck and I hauled this to his machine shop and he built me a base. Next slide. This is Randy at the, on the right of the slide. He's the guy that did this. And this is my new concrete base for that tower. He welded this together um, and made it match and fit the other tower so that we knew when I brought the crane above with the tower, uh, above the poured concrete base, we knew it would line up. Next slide. Okay, I took it to Dixon, Illinois to have it hot dip galvanized because there was no tank big enough to do that in my local area so i drove the thing in a home depot rental truck down to illinois to have it galvanized i left it there and about a week later they called and said it's done and i went and picked it up and brought it back next slide okay the other thing that had a change was the rotators that i'm now using are prop pitch rotators that required bigger and different holes in the plates these plates are were fabricated from stainless steel by the late N9JUU. He was a mechanical guru, but he was a silent key. So what I did is I took these plates out of the tower and gave the drawings from K7NV to my machine shop guy, and he laser cut the stainless steel to make the new holes correct in the stainless. Luckily, these guys are very good. It all worked the first time. It really helps to have competent engineers and staff around you. Next slide. Pour the, pouring the concrete, uh, next slide. All right, setting up the concrete base, putting in reinforcement bar to make it nice and strong, making everything nice and level and keeping it that way even when the concrete starts entering the hole and putting gravel underneath so that drainage can happen. Next slide. All right, and here is the concrete base, which turned out to be 16 and a half cubic yards of concrete. Uh, and then we put a little cable transition for the heliax along the left side. You can see that little trough to allow a graceful transition from the heliax from the vertical tower down to the lawn. Next slide. Okay, and then uh, while this was setting up, I would do other things, build the the, uh, the chokes for the feed points. These are home brewed from RG393 coax with DIN connectors, and I was going for... Um, Maximum performance, minimum loss. Next slide. I built my own phasing lines. These are made out of 7 8 inch Heliax cable. Uh, this was used cable, obviously, but I trimmed them and electrically measured them to make sure that the phase was within 0.1 degree of each other on each of these four phasing lines so that the Aggies were phase matched. Next slide. Okay, here's the homebrew four-way power splitter that I made. This uses Lance's design. He designed this. It's a brass hobby tube centered in a 
piece of aluminum channel using Teflon insulators. And I built this and was happy to see that it measured one to one SWR from 50 to 50.1 megahertz. Next slide. All right, here's the tower, adding the ladder to it while the concrete sets up. Next. All right, building elements. This was done in the middle of winter, so luckily I used my heated garage and I built these inside carefully, slowly, and trying to do everything right. Next slide. Yagi booms were assembled that next spring out on the grass on the lawn. Next slide. Uh, here we're here we are um, doing the Yagi construction, including the Yagi booms. And as you know, when you use round booms, the good part of that is you've only got two thirds of the wind surface area because of the round shape. The bad news is it's much harder to align all of the elements on the same plane. So the way I did this is I used U bolts around the round tube. And I basically used a level on each of the elements that I would move that level so that I would precisely set the spacing of the elements to the millimeter while also simultaneously setting the level of the elements so that they were in the same plane. And uh, that's, that's how I built the Yagis. And I could not move one of these myself. I'm a pretty strong guy, but these are 58 feet long and each one weighs 135 pounds and they're rather floppy. So when you get one of these built, it's it's also top heavy when you put the T-brace on it. And so it took two people to move one of these, but we didn't do that. All right, next slide. And here are the Yagis while we're building them and then adding the T-braces in the center. And then I basically tied off the T-brace so that the top heavy nature would not roll over and uh, and destroy the elements. All right, next slide. Okay, the rotator came from originally, those of you that go back 50 years, here's an aircraft from World War II, uh, the B-29. And that aircraft was a, um, that was a bomber aircraft that was developed to go very high altitudes. And well, that, um, uh, after those were not being used anymore, the prop pitch motors for those became available. Some hams discovered those and started using them for antenna rotators. That is the actual, uh, the rotator that I use on my azimuth came from a B-29. It was a K7 NV overhaul of, of a B-29 prop pitch motor, which is the extra large. And it weighs about 90 pounds. Uh, next slide. And there it is after uh, the K7 NV conversion to make it ready for ham use. He welds on um, a, a K7 NV mast clamp that grabs around your mast. And then of course, on the left and right side of these sawhorses, you see the bearings that are used in my system. These are professional bearings that K7 NV designed. He's the mechanical design uh, brains behind this. I'm the electrical guy, but he did really well with the mechanical part. Next slide. Um, I had a problem when that rotator was shipped to me. One of the rings, the one shown here, got lost. Uh, what we think happened is it, it tore through the box, which you can see in the lower right of this photo, and was lost in some shipping trailer, never to be found again. Um, this is a major problem when we discovered that this was missing, because where do you get another one of these? It's from a World War II aircraft. You don't just go to Home Depot and buy another uh, prop pitch motor ring. So luckily, Kurt Andrus, K7NV, knew a guy in California that had another one of these prop pitch motors from the same aircraft. And thank God he was able to recover this ring. And uh, he updated it, painted it, got it lubed and ready to go for me and, and sent it to me to uh, complete my project. Next slide. This is what the complete rotator looks like. This is the azimuth extra large rotator. Next slide. All right, and then this is what it looks like when pre-fitted and tested in the tower. So this is the azimuth rotator, which hangs below the rotor plate. And then there are bearings in both the mid plate and the upper plate. Next slide. All right, this uses a three inch chromoly mast. Um, notice the professional bearings that have grease zerk on them. It's really articulating bearings. Everything is very, it operates like a well-oiled machine. Very, I'm very pleased with the design. Next slide. 
we fabricated some Roan 55G, which was our cross boom, uh, to become the H frame. Next slide. And here's what the cross boom looks like as we're preparing it. And obviously, that piece on the end that was customized to allow trussing of the vertical struts on the uh, on the H frame. Next slide. And he, the old way we used to attach the vertical struts is we used to just bolt them onto the side of the tower. But I wanted to get this more on the center of gravity, so I opted to change this and put them in the middle of the tower section. Next slide. Because everything is about balance. So I modified the plates that I used. And with between myself and my machine shop person, we devised these plates that we attach the vertical supports to. Next slide. And they're inside the tower section. Here's lightning protection that I use on my control wires per wire. Next slide. And let's see, added boom trusses, phasing lines, and balance to the Yagis, getting them ready to go. You can see the 7 8 phasing lines on the Yagis now. Next slide. Here's the top of the tower with the lower piece of the elevation rotator now mounted. And then Kurt Andrus also built these little metal boots that go over the bearings to rain protect those. Really good idea, but yet they have a little rubber... Uh, folding thing that you can raise them up so that you can raise them up to grease the grease zerk underneath them where the bearing is. Next slide. I also like having a camera on my array so that even when sitting in my radio room, I can see where's the moon pointed. This is my camera. Next slide. And here's the crane setting the tower. Next slide, or the day that it got set. All right, then I hand dug the trench to place the Heliax cable. Um, I wanted to just direct bury this, but my my good friend, who's he's now a silent key, but the late KB8RQ, uh, he told me, he said, Dave, make sure you put some rodent protection around your cables. And I thought to myself, I don't want to go through all this work and expense and then find some rodent chews into my Heliax and destroys my system. So I... I found some irrigation pipe that farmers use for draining their land, and I put the Heliax inside of that. So there's a plastic protection uh, over the cables. But pulling the cables inside that was really difficult. I did this by myself because who's going to help me? So I ended up kind of using ropes and my lawnmower to kind of pull, and then I pulled by hand. It was not pretty, but it worked and got the job done. Next slide. Luckily, I got it done because the next day we got a little bit of snow before I even had the trench back filled. Okay, next slide. Uh, here is November 2019, getting the, the antennas were ready to go. You can see the crane ruts in the lawn. That was from setting the tower itself. Uh, and then the antennas on the ground ready to go up. Next slide. All right, this is the elevation rotator design by K7NV. He was a mechanical engineer. Next slide. And this design was built. Um, I had M squared rotators in the past, and I I was spending all of my time fixing them. And, and so I wanted something highly reliable. And um, I was told, oh, MT3000 will be big enough. No. Um, in my experience, that's not accurate. So. Um, M squared did build one rotator that I think would have worked. It was called the MT5000. They made two of these. They were more or less prototypes. K5QE has one of them. He's in Texas. I think he uses it on two meters, maybe. The other one, I believe, is in Hawaii. I tried to buy the other one, but was not able to do that. Could never find, even working through Mike Stahl, could not find who currently owns it. So... Whoever it was sold to apparently cannot be heard, heard from again. So I said, okay, if I can't buy one, I'm going to I'll get one built. So I tasked K7NV. I said, would you be willing to build me one of these? And I told him the requirements. And he designed this and built this to my specifications. It turned out beautifully. Uh, next slide. This is the design of that rotator. Here are all the parts in his truck. And he basically took this to various shops to have the, the cutting, the painting, the, all the different processes done. Next slide. And then Kurt is a welder. He did the welding himself. Now, I told you earlier that in shipping that 
uh, extra large azimuth rotator to my house, my favorite shipping carrier lost one of the pieces. Well, it takes a lot to get me very upset, but losing a part from my World War II rotator made me very upset. Um, in reflecting on, now we have these elevation rotators to go get from Kurt out in Nevada. I don't trust that shipping carrier anymore. No matter how well it's packed, I don't trust them. How do we do this? Uh, well, my friend N0TB came up with an idea. His brother had just bought a new pickup truck with a really nice double cab in it. And he said, why don't four of us drive out to, to the West Coast and go pick this thing up? Well, okay. Uh, uh, we did that. And it's a little bit crazy because that's 4,419 miles or 7112 kilometers round trip. That's how far this is. But that's what we did. We drove to Nevada because this way we controlled the shipment of those devices and made sure that nothing got lost or damaged. Next slide. Here's the group of four of us. The other thing I wanted to say, N0TB was getting interested in moon bounce the same time I was building my array. And when K7NV was building my elevation rotator, Tim also joined in and said, I'd like to buy one also. So when Kurt built these, he built two of them. Um, and Tim bought one and I bought one. So Tim's brother, Dean, is the gentleman in the black shirt here. And Dean and his truck and then some other friends here drove out to Nevada to go get our rotors. And uh, on the left is N0TB. I'm in the orange shirt. Uh, Dean is in black shirt. And then tan shirt is Ralph, N9BDR. Uh, this was taken in Spearfish, South Dakota, on the way to that trip by W0VB. Next slide. Here's the rotator that uh, resulted. And this is a beautiful piece of work in my, in my view. Um, it's heavy. Uh, it weighs, I don't know, three or 400 pounds. But it's built modular in a modular manner in pieces, and it works just incredibly and it uses a prop pitch rotator sideways to do the turning there's nothing that i've been not able to turn with this next slide here's the h frame uh that's next to the house and then i uh put this up on an old farm trailer uh which used to be a manure spreader back in the day on the early farms uh but that was a perfect cart for setting this up and building my uh, rotator and the H frame. Next slide. I added all the trussing and it's trussed in, in four planes, or t I'm sorry, two planes, four directions. And then I hired lifts or cranes to put the antennas on, uh, and this with professional tower crew, because these antennas are big enough, I could not do this safely myself. They put the H frame up on the tower, and then they also put the four antennas on. Next slide. We put the bottom two on first so that we would get that bottom weight, and then we put the top two on last, and then, of course, route the feed lines into the center where the power divider is. Next slide. And here is the completed array. Finally, in August 2020, uh, things were on the air, so we are finally ready to go. Um, next slide. Um, one of the other interests that Tim, N0TB, has is he has drones, and he's really into photography. And one day he came over when we had kind of the fall colors. I live next to a, kind of a swamp. It's called Goose Lake, but it's more like a swamp. But anyway, Tim caught the colors pretty nice here, and it showed the moon bounce array with the house. And, and uh, So this photo is thanks to N0TB and his drone. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, after that, things were working great, but six months later, I found out people with smaller antennas were hearing better than I was. And I thought, this is strange. Why is this? Well, uh, some friends made me remember a thing that I teach in my communications class here at school, signal to noise ratio. And um, long story short, I started noise hunting to find out why I could no longer hear. Next slide. Uh, one of the things I discovered, my Heliax connectors that are type RPC, bad quality. They're very easy to install, but even after a year of being on the tower, I could loosely turn these by hand. Those should not self-loosen like that. That was a quality problem. So all those got replaced with the older 
L5 PDF type connectors that screw on real tight with a wrench. Those work great. Next slide. Another finding, I found an arcing transformer across the road that was contributing 9 dB to my noise floor. And when that was fixed and I still couldn't hear, I kept noise hunting and I found another 20 dB of noise arcing lightning arresters just across the road on a power pole, another 20 dB of noise. Together, that fixed 29 dB of noise from my power company fixed these. Next slide. After that, I still could not hear. So a friend of mine said, unplug your camera on your array. I said, I did that already. It didn't matter. Well, in hindsight, the reason I didn't find it the first time is all of that other power line noise was covering up the noise from my camera. The camera also contributed another 13 dB more of noise. So between that and the power line noise, I had 42 dB of noise right by my antennas. I mean, within several feet of the antennas was the camera. And then, of course, within a quarter of a mile were all of the power line noise sources. No wonder I could not hear. Next slide. All right, one of the things I did then is I looked at the uh, the feed point chokes, and I used a different design there. This didn't really turn out to help a whole lot, but in theory, it seemed like it would, so I tried it. Next slide. Uh, then the array was up almost one year, <laughs> and my wife and I came back from a travel trip, and one of these came through in the middle of the night. Now, having done EME before, I know to have my array tied down, but... I still was a little bit discouraged that not even a year after I put it up, a tornado came through, and it had winds that were almost 100 miles per hour. Next slide. So the next morning, there's what look there's what my yard looked like. I measured a 94.1 mile an hour wind, uh, and the tornado basically did some damage to uh, the moon bounce array. One of the Yagis was broken off on the back. So I had to replace one boom section. Uh, but that's what happens when a tornado mixes with Yagis. Even though those Yagis are designed to 100 mile an hour, um, the, uh, uh, there was some repair work. So I did the repairs. And as you can see in the top photo, that was my single horizon only LFA-10. Uh, that was a really thin two-inch round boom that snapped in half because the tornado hit it broadside. Um, I can't fault the boom for that. Um, I was disappointed that I didn't think to turn that antenna into the wind, but we were so tired after coming home from travel, I was just, I just didn't think of it. So anyway, if any of you have high winds approaching, the lesson learned, try to predict the direction of that wind, turn your antennas into the wind to mitigate damage. Next slide. Okay, I'm very thankful for support from all these people. My wife has been incredibly patient and tolerant. Lance, Justin, Lionel, Kurt, Paul, Tim, Dean, Ralph, Tim, Paul, Ray, Don, Randy, just some of the people. Uh, the, the, an undertaking like this is a huge project, and uh, all these people helped. So uh, my thanks, heartfelt thanks to everybody um that helped get this done next slide okay what were the results um since having put this up i've been lucky to work 26 new countries that's really the big reason i do this i like chasing dxcc's these are the ones that i have so far successfully added to my tally um with the with the four by ten array um next slide um, not really much of a contester, but I have dabbled in the Moon Bounce contest just because they're extra fun for me. Uh, next slide. was lucky last year to make a pretty good 79 QSOs. I'm very happy with that. This year I'm going to try for 100 QSOs. So if any of you can do 6 meter Q65 um, and you can um, do Moon Bounce, Love it if you'd give me a call on 28 or 29 October. Uh, but if, you know, I'm going to do the best I can. And then uh, my wife has shared with me that we're moving QTHs after this. After that, the whole moon bounce thing is probably going to come to an end, at least for me. So I'm playing big while I have it in front of me. All 
right, next slide. Okay, uh, let's see. Key learnings, balance the array, um, the antennas. I really like the low Q designs such as the LFA. Uh, and I know that there's debate over people that love them, people that don't. I'm a believer. I believe they really are helpful for a couple of reasons. One, I don't have a lot of noise with those antennas. Two, they're pretty broadbanded even when they're covered with ice and snow and, and water. And uh, they're stable in their, in their electrical parameters. So I like them for my QTH. Uh, H-frame strength and center of gravity. Yagi boom and vertical clamps don't twist. Um, I went overkill on those because in my past four nines array, I had antennas that would twist so that part of the array was towed into another part and it just didn't, you know, it, they weren't square. So you have to have things that don't slip so you can maintain that square, um, trying to do that with my hands, the squareness of the array. All right. Um, rotators have to be plenty big and uh, the K7 NV prop pitch rotors work great. Uh, computer tracking, uh, and I like the green heron controllers. Those have been excellent so far. Positional feedback, I'm a believer in having a camera on my array. So what I do now is I turn the camera on, but then the minute I have the array pointed and I know it's on the moon, I unplug the camera so that it kills the 13 dB of noise from the camera. I would love to leave it on, but I can't tolerate that much noise and I believe it's the heater in the plastic case that I have that's causing the noise. I've looked into fixing the EMI and I've just not had the time. Um, so I just unplug it and, and do that for now. Uh, the array survived 100 mile per hour winds almost. Uh, power splitter, 100% duty cycle, tie down straps. I tie my array in six places using 6,700 pound filistrand. And I found these quick clamp uh, clamps that are real easy to snap on, snap off. They're made for professional rigging and lifting. Um, I think I bought them from Western Rigging Company, something like this. They are um, they really work nice for tying down the array. Uh, and then the LNA at the tower top. Um, I don't know if that helps or not, but I did that. Okay, next slide. Finally, if you want to reference any of the materials, here are my sources. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, are there any questions that I can answer? I, I think that's amazing, Dave. This, I, I must admit, I, I hadn't seen, Tammy had an advanced note to me, for me on, on seeing the slides, but obviously because if you, down, you downloaded them earlier on. But I mean, the scale of it all, I wrote down slide 92. If anybody doesn't quite believe the scale, that was the one where all of the um, machinery was there to move it. It's incredible. And you're thinking of moving? <laughs> I'd like to see the uh, particulars of that. It was not that. my idea. The moving thing was not my idea. <laughs> I mean, where is your wife going to hang out all the washing and stuff if you get rid of that? <laughs> and the birds. Where that's are the what, birds going to land? Exactly. That's what I would say. Um, we've got quite a big garden, dear. Mm. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so if you have got any questions or comments, we've got a couple of comments for you, um, but if you've got any questions apart from why and how and that sort of thing, then please drop them onto BATC or Facebook now because I think we, uh, Dave actually in all seriousness hasn't got too much longer. We've already seen a student come in um, and uh, you've been on with us quite a long time, Dave, with for about an hour now. So. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments, please ask them now. Um, I've got a couple for you. Um, again, probably more to do with people that you w probably won't know, um, but local people. Tony M G Zero M Q G on BATC says that I remember Doug Mallet, whose call sign was G Three H U L, doing EME on seventy centimeters. Although he had the sad job of dismantling his aerials when he went silent key a few years ago. Does does this equipment, do these antennas and things have to be quite large? Um, de it depends how you're going to um, do moon bounce. There are guys that, that operate with one antenna and do moon bounce. I did that for a number of years before I put this back up. It just works so much easier and nicer with a large array. So, n no, you don't have to put up something this crazy big. But the fun factor is so much nicer 
uh, and, and there are various degree, uh, um, degrees of, of how big people build things. There are four tens, there are four nines. Um, OH2BC has the biggest array in the world. He has eight sevens. Um, oh, goodness me. Kyrie's a great guy. He, he put up eight sevens. That was my original thought for my plan, but I, I backed away from it. He built that, and uh, that's a little bigger gain-wise than mine. Um, then you've got others that are four sevens, four sixes, four fives. Um, I don't know if I answered the question, David. Well, no, but it I depends. Mean, I was just sort of. I mean, there will be people with much smaller gardens, and you know, I, I guess I'm asking: Is there any chance that they're going to get anything from that? How, how big a, an array do you have to have to get something? You've certainly showed us with the problems that you're having later that it, you've got to get every detail right, not just the antenna. You've got to make sure every bit of cable is right, make sure there's no local interference, which, of course, is a big problem for all of us now. I'm sure for you over there in the U.S., and, and this is certainly over here with various things like, you know, um, ground source heat, heat pumps and things like this. So um, anyway, it is uh, it is incredible. Um, Paul G3VPT over on Facebook is asking... Uh, in the 1950s, he says that EME was demonstrated on TV using AM. Um, he thinks it may have been on Tomorrow's World. Um, Tomorrow's World was a, a great British program that ran for many, many years, showing the technology of tomorrow, basically, and, and, idea, and products and, and gadgets and, and technology for tomorrow. Um, is that, do you know anything about the 1950s sort of EME with the TV on AM? I'm afraid I don't, David. Uh, that's that's before my time, and I, I, I hate to say I've never used AM. I, I have had it on some radios I've had, but I know on 160 it used to be a thing, but I, I have not used it. So, unfortunately, I, I'm, I can't really comment a lot on that. But that's great stuff. Can, can I ask a question now, that, um, and I'm not doubting anything you're doing, of course, but um, obviously, when uh, when I've heard of EME over the years, I've heard that people send a picture, a signal back to the moon, and then wait for the delay and wait for it to come back. If you're communicating with other people, though, instead of that, how do you, or how do you, or how do they know that you're doing it for sure via the moon, and you're not doing it by either some more direct path, either using the ionosphere or ground waves? Sure. Um, well, uh, when we did it with CW. You could listen and time it, and you would typically send the letter V a number of times, and you would hear your echoes come back. The way that I would typically make people know that it was really EME is I would have them go outside and look at my antennas, and I would point my antennas straight at the moon, and I would transmit, and I would have them listen to the echoes. Then I would turn the array off of the moon, and then I would transmit the same thing and try it again, and you would not hear anything. So it kind of proves that signal was coming back via a reflection off the moon. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I thought it would be something like that. That you, So you still, even if you're aiming at other people, you, I guess you do still get that bounce back so you can listen for it and be really sure. Um, uh, one other random thing I wrote down here, because I don't think we've got any other questions have come up. Oh, we have got one from Richard Neal. He said, is there much of a voice delay when contacting others? So how many seconds is it roughly? 2.7 seconds, depending on the how high up the moon is. Um, and yes, uh, I did do a couple contacts with voice. Let's see, was that two meters? I think maybe on two meters. It's really difficult. You have to have two people that have really, really big antennas. But when the conditions are right, it does work. Um, but the delay is the same, 2.7 seconds. Uh, the physics, in terms of what happens to the signal on the way to the moon and back, messes up the signals so much that that's why you have to have such crazy big antennas to make this work well. Because on a good day, you lose 93% of your signal. 7% is what you get back on a good day. That's that's a good day. <laughs> so, and, and have the computers that are now used for lots of the, the methods of, or the J modes that you were talking about and things, using computers for it, has that um, increase the number of things that you can do with your, you know, with the hobby with EME. Yes, it has. It has. Um, it has leveraged that difficult path by adding, and I believe they're saying the number is 15 dB of improvement versus the CW days, because that's how much forward error correction. That's how much technology can be leveraged to 
um, improve valid decodes and valid communications via a two-way path. The other thing that's kind of nice about the WSJT modes is they display in every decode what's called a DT or delta time, difference in time. What that is is your round trip delay to your destination to the moon and back. So one of the things that you always that we always look at on EME to make sure that the decode that you have is valid and not a terrestrial signal or something else is to check for is it about 2.7 seconds and typically it'll run between 2.6 seconds and maybe up as high as 3.1 or 3.2 on the outside case seconds depending how good the clock accuracy is on both pc clocks but if it's not inside that 2.6 to 3.1 or 2 second range it's not eme and that's the other indicator that you have you, you still have to use your brain even though the software is doing a lot of processing to help you still have to you st it's a tool. It's not doing everything. You know, you still have to use your brain to to uh, to communicate. But it has definitely changed the way the game is played. And uh, and believe me, I'm a I'm a full CW guy. I love CW. I do miss those days. I'm sure. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here and show us that incredible project. Until we got to that slide, as I said, I didn't really realize how big they were. Um, but uh, I'm going to work on my wife and see if she'll we can put something like this up but um anyway oh i've got one other quick question for you i'm going to just read this to you uh jim g3 yla very inspiring david but for a small garden and no elevation control for how long is it possible to listen while the moon is very low up to say 10 degrees or more otherwise you might wow. have to try so if you could quickly answer that i'm trying to get there before three o'clock for you in your time absolutely yes great question uh first of all for an antenna uh, obviously, the longer the boom, the more gain that it is there, the, the easier it will be. But I have seen people with five or six element antennas that I have been able to work. Um, if you want to test your system, please try listening for me on the 28th, 29th of October. Uh, you can point your antenna straight at the moon. And, and if you would like help figuring out where that is, I, I'll use Moonsked. Email me offline, and I'll and I'll help you with that. I'll need your grid square to do that. But you could listen in and uh, and give it a try. The big thing is your noise profile around your location. That's usually the thing that cripples people. And then um, a low loss feed line. You want to have a feed line that is one dB or less of loss. If you have a really long high loss feed line you're not going to hear anything. But if you can keep that feed line loss under 1 dB as a general rule, uh, you, some people would say you only need the LNA in your radio. You don't even need one up at the tower top. So you can simplify things a lot. Um, Use decent cable, anything. maybe. Yes. Yeah, don't, don't skimp on anything like that. Dave, it's been a joy. I'll, I'll leave the last word, I think, with Roger G3RDI, who says, what fantastic enthusiasm... Dave and congratulations for it. Uh, Roy will be drooling, he says, and I'm sure he is. And I miss Roy. I miss. We love our British friends. Um, thank you, everybody. I, it was my pleasure to share this with you. I hope you got some enjoyment out of it. I was delighted to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, and please let us know when you put your house on the market because I can't wait to see the details that to explain that away in the back garden. Thanks very much, Dave, and uh, thanks to your students as well. For, 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 you for releasing so you for an hour. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. There we are. What a, uh, what a project. Yeah. I just could not, I genuinely, I hadn't seen the size <laughs> of the scale until I saw that. It's brilliant. Thank you very much to Dave. Uh, KJ89i, that's really, really good. Um, and thanks for all of your comments as well. I think well and Dave's actually them. just talking. Oh, really? He's... Okay, well, we could bring him back. Yeah. If, I thought you would have to go about three o'clock, but anyway. We'll try and bring him back on. Here we go. Stay there, Dave. We're just going to press okay. the buttons. Here we are. But you're back. We can hear you. Okay. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking. Oh, we we you thought you were coming something. back to us. And oh. We thought you wanted to come back. We thought you were waving oh, furiously. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought there was another. I thought there was another question. Not Why? really. Although there is something um, that someone else added. Uh, where was that? Oh, Tony said that G. Doug, G3HUL, is sadly silent key now. He thinks he used a 28 meg transceiver a multiplier uh, with a, a transverter, I guess, to 432 megs and then amplified with a, care, a pair of 4CX250s. I think they're valves, aren't they? So, yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. Could very well be. Anyway, yeah, Dave, we are going to let you get back to your work and your students. And thanks ever so much again. It's been a real pleasure for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And have a great evening. Thank you. And you. Thank you. There we are. That's Dave. And he's uh, it's three o'clock his time, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So thanks very much to him for joining us. Um, until we, uh, uh, just a few uh, summary of what's happening on the club this week. Again, it's Saturday, it's got the Kablensked at 10 a.m. And Sunday, we've got the GB Tourist News on GB3 MB at 7 o'clock. Uh, Monday at, at 7.30, the Monday Night Net, also on GB3 MB. And at 8 o'clock, the 80 meter CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then this, a week tonight, on Wednesday, October the 25th, we meet at the CNS School with the 6th form common room between 7 and 9.30. And uh, it's a social informal. And also, for those of you who got Raspberry Pi projects, we've got Jeff and James who'll help you with those. And I think that's it all apart from that. So we look forward to seeing you here on Narc Live in two weeks' time. But until then, from Tammy M0TC. Bye bye. And from me, David G7RP. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.